Absolutely. I mean, you need to decide whether you're going to do it or not, you know. Uh, it's um, very nice to see you all here on such an inclement and miserable evening. Uh, let's start with a prayer. So uh, perhaps you would like to stand and we'll start with the opening prayer that is on the back of the, uh, on the, back of the programs. So we begin our meeting in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, as we prepare to study your word, open the eyes of our understanding and prepare our hearts by the power of your spirit, that we may receive your word with much joy and that we may leave tonight having a deeper understanding of who you are. This we ask in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So once again, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome so many of you uh, here tonight. As you know, this is the fourth night of our journey through uh, the New Testament, learning more about the New Testament, and learning especially about the Gospel of Mark, seeking the face of Jesus Christ. So delighted to welcome you all um, really is good of you to come out. Delighted on your behalf to welcome again Professor James Edwards, who's come all the way from America to be with us. Uh, the practical announcements are the same as they were the, the last few nights. There is no fire drill planned, so if the al alarm goes off, it means there's a fire and you should leave. Uh, there is a first aid station at the back of the cathedral and we're filming this event uh, so that those who can't be here can follow it afterwards. And without further ado, Ado, let's welcome Professor James Edwards with a real round of applause. Thank you, Father Patrick. Well, this is day four, and I want you to know how much I am enjoying being here. I've had wonderful conversations with many of you. Um, it may be it may be dark and damp and cool outside, but this group has lots of energy, smiles, uh, engagement, activity, and I'm just as thrilled as I could possibly be to be here. If I were speaking in America, there would be 25 people here. Um, and so I am more than impressed by all of you who are coming out and making the kinds of sacrifices that you are making to be here night after night. Well, this is our fourth out of five evenings together, and last night we began the first of a two-part series, uh, namely, Who is Jesus? I began last night's talk by saying that the Gospel of Mark whittles down his purview, his purpose, to basically two questions. I don't think any of the other Gospels are quite as... Uh, economical in this respect as in Mark. Mark only wants to ask these and answer these two questions. Who is Jesus? What's the proper understanding of Jesus? And as you know, it's the Son of God, but it's not the Son of God you might think, the Son of God in power, the Son of God in glory, the Son of God in might, the Son of God of claim, but whom? The Son of God who is only known at the cross. The Apostle Paul will say, that's a scandalous idea, that's highly offensive, and so it's exactly right. The Son of God is the great surprise of who God is. We, we think we know who God is, we think we can create a God in our own image, but the Gospel of Mark says, no, that's, that's not the real God. The real God is the God who comes and who stands beside you in suffering and death so that you might live and live forever. Now tonight we're going to talk about the second major uh, image of Mark, and that is what does it mean to be a disciple? But before we do that, we're going to start in this first hour and ask a more basic question, and that is, uh, what can we say about the New Testament as a historical document? One of the things that we most frequently ask of a document as old as the New Testament is, is there any way to 
verify or to tell how truthful it is. Is it historical or not? And this is particularly important with regard to the New Testament because the message of the New Testament is a historical message. Now, there are forms of truth that are not historical, philosophical, or moral, or spiritual in some ways. But the gospel is a historical narrative. It makes a claim that we call the incarnation. And the incarnation is the assertion that the God who made this world and who superintends this world and who is apart from this world has entered into this world as a human being in the form of God and God in the form of a human being. Fully human and fully divine. Not half divine, half human, but fully both. There is no other religion in the world that makes a claim like this. This is a very scandalous claim that the God of beyond time and space would in fact reduce God's self into this frame of a historical person, Jesus of Nazareth. And this then makes the New Testament unequivocally a historical document and it makes sense for us, we have every right to do so, ask the question that we're going to ask today, how can we, if not be certain of this, I don't think we can always prove historical events, in fact, we rarely can, but we can certainly respond to them on the basis of probabilities and certitudes. And the Gospel of Mark invites that question, and we're going to consider it today. Jesus of Nazareth, if he was a historical person, what can we say about the accounts of him in the Gospels? I want to mention two or three things today in this first hour. The New Testament mentions many historical persons and events that are also attested outside of the New Testament in other sources of literature. And it's helpful for us to learn something from those sources because it increases the credibility of the stories that we read in the New Testament. I want to talk about dating. How do we date certain issues and events in the New Testament? I want to talk secondly about verification. Uh, we read some things in the New Testament that strike most of us as being questionable we ask ourselves, did such and such really happen? I'll give you two examples uh, among many. We'll talk about those. Then I want to talk about some of the main characters. Uh, Jesus, of course, doesn't just appear by himself, but the New Testament mentions other people. It mentions Pontius Pilate, who is supposedly a governor of Rome. It mentions Herod the Great. It mentions John the Baptist. And of course, it mentions Jesus. Is there any witness or reference to Jesus outside of the New Testament in first century literature? So that's our purview this morning. We want to ask the question, what kind of of testimony do we see outside the New Testament for the figures and the, the um, events that are recorded in the New Testament. Let's take a look. Let's talk about dating. In some instances, a reference in a secular historical source can help us date a New Testament event. I'll give you an example. In Acts chapter 18, we see the story of the Apostle Paul, who is in Corinth, who gets hailed before a proconsul by the name of Gallio, who was the proconsul of Asia. We see that word, Gallio, Gallio, a proconsul of Asia. 
Now, there's a personal name. There's a Roman office, a proconsul. A proconsul was a governor of a senatorial province. There were two provinces in the ancient world. Senatorial provinces were provinces that were in safe territories. There was really no fear of uprising against Rome. Uh, Corinth was one of those provinces. There were another province that were out on the frontier that were not under proconsuls. They were under the emperor himself. They were called imperial uh, uh, provinces because they were dangerous. They were um, electric and they were very unstable. Palestine is one of those. Palestine is not a senatorial province. So Pontius Pilate is directly responsible. He's got a hotline to whom? To Caesar. So that they can respond quickly if there is trouble on the Eastern Front. Well, Gallio is a proconsul. He's a, he's a standard, very well known uh, political figure in Corinth. Corinth was a large city. It so happens that Gallio was the brother of Seneca, the Roman philosopher. And we know about Seneca and we know about Gallio from Seneca himself, from Dio Cassius, from Pliny the Elder. So this particular Gallio that Luke mentions in the book of Acts is also attested by several other ancient writers. But we don't know, or we did not know, exactly when Gallio ruled Corinth. Until 1905, when an inscription of the Emperor Claudius Claudius was a first century uh, emperor. There was a famous uh, television series, I, Claudius, that you uh, folks here in the British Isles put on. Claudius ruled from 41 to 54. He, his name shows up in the New Testament, too. At Delphi, a inscription was discovered in 1905 that dated Gallio's rule of Asia, Asia is not the Far East, it was the province of Asia, it's just Western Turkey, from July 51 to August 52. So this name, this date, and this office came together in 1905, and we can say that in Acts chapter 18, verses 12 through 17, when Paul appears before Gallio, we can get that down to a 12, or actually a 13 month period between July of 51 and August of 52. It's tied up, it's historically verifiable, and it's assured. Let's talk about events themselves. There are instances in the New Testament when we read a story that strikes us uh, oftentimes as rather improbable or even fantastic and legendary. There aren't many like that. I think most of the stories are, they could at least be credible. They don't strike us as being um, improbable. But there is a story in Acts chapter 12 that when you read it, you do scratch your head and you think, I wonder if that could possibly be true. It's a story of the death of Herod Agrippa I. Now, this word Herod is very confusing because there are four rulers in the New Testament who bear that name. The most important is also the most infamous, Herod the Great. The second is the one who beheads John the Baptist and who also tries Jesus, that's Herod Antipas. That's Herod the Great's son. The third Herod is Herod Agrippa I, and this is the one that we're talking about in Acts chapter 12. And Herod Agrippa I is a grandson of Herod the Great. So we have a Herodian dynasty 
in which the name of Herod is passed down to four generations, and not just straight down, but acrosswise from all kinds of cousins and relations as well. So it's highly confusing. So enough said, this is the grandson of Herod the Great, who appears in the 12th chapter of the book of Acts. He is the one who beheads the apostle James, not the brother of Jesus, but the James who is the brother of John, one of those fishermen by the Sea of Galilee, the first four fishermen, in fact, that Jesus calls, Herod Agrippa I. Now, in the 12th chapter of Acts, we read this statement that Herod Agrippa I, after he killed James, went to Syrophoenicia to the north and dressed up in a gleaming white garment that in the sunlight made him look like an angel and people swooned and they called him a god. And rather than telling them to relax, this was just all fantastic and this was showbiz, he accepted this and he absorbed it as though, in fact, he was a god. And so the author of the book of Acts, Luke, says this, an angel of the Lord struck Agrippa, I'm quoting Luke here, Acts chapter 12, struck Agrippa down because he did not give God glory. And Agrippa was eaten by worms, and he breathed his last and died. So we have this gruesome, grotesque description of a vain ruler who over exceeds and uh, pretentiously tends to be God or pretends to be God and somehow suffers a collapse or a being struck down by God himself. And I think we may read this and think, oh, I, I have some doubts about that. Well, it so happens that the, Julius, that the Jewish historian Josephus also talks about this story. Now, I've mentioned Josephus before several times. Uh, just to remind you, Josephus was, in fact, a Jewish general who fought against the Romans in the first Jewish revolt between 66 and 70. But when he was defeated, rather than committing suicide, he decided to betray the cause. And he told the Roman general, Vespasian, that if Vespasian would not kill him, he would accompany Vespasian to Jerusalem and help him defeat the Jews who were fighting Rome. And so G Josephus is basically a Jewish traitor who then is, um, is uh, rewarded by the Roman government by being sent back to Rome. He's given a villa, he's funded, and he gets to write Jewish history for, history for the rest of his life. He's a fairly unsavory character, but we owe a lot to him because he is the chief primary first century historian who was present in these events, and he's a very, very valuable source. Josephus tells this same story, and it actually corroborates this ghastly death that we read about in Acts. This is what Josephus says, that Agrippa visited Caesarea to celebrate honors to Caesar. He entered into the theater. He dressed in a garment of silver texture. That's what Josephus calls it. That flashed with radiance in the sunlight. Luke doesn't tell us that. It just, it just said he, he shone. Well, Josephus tells us why. It's some kind of a reflective cloth. And people began to hail him as God. Agrippa failed to to chastise them, rather he accepted their flattery and says, this is what Josephus says, immediately he saw an omen of God, he felt a stab of pain in his heart 
He was gripped in his stomach by an ache that he felt everywhere at once and that was intense from the start. He laid in a swoon for five days after which the pain in his abdomen was so great that he departed life in pain and agony in the 54th year of his life, end quote Josephus. And so we see from Josephus himself a story of this same death told in slightly different words, but it's equally gross and grotesque about the vanity of one of the Herodian clan who overreached and who suffered some kind of a fatal reaction because of it. A second um, verification is of a very different nature. Oftentimes, we will read something in the New Testament that about a place that we don't know exists. There is, for example, a story in Mark chapter 8 where Jesus has been over on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Remember, the east side of the Sea of Galilee is the Decapolis. This is the Roman area. It's not a Jewish area. And Jesus is coming back from the east side of the Sea of Galilee to the west side. The west side is the Jewish area. And we are told that he put in at the harbor of Dalmanutha or Magdala. It's one of two names. Don't exactly know why there's two names, but there are. Well, nobody ever knew where that was. And many scholars thought this is a good example of the fact that the New Testament writers really don't know their geography, and they're simply making up the name of a place. There is no such place called Dalmanutha or Magdala. Well, you'll be glad to know that the author of my commentary on the book of Acts 15 years before this was able to pinpoint exactly where Dalmanutha and Magdala was. I researched this question pretty carefully and it looked to me like it had to be right there on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee, about three or four miles north of the city of Tiberias. And uh, about 15 years ago, that place was discovered at exactly where I thought it should be. And today, you can go there, and it is one of the more famous tourist sites at the Sea of Galilee. They've got a spa, they got a show of this. It's a, it's a wonderful site. This becomes one of the oldest and earliest synagogues that's ever been discovered in Palestine. And it's exactly where Mark tells us, but until 15 years ago, nobody knew that it was there, and many scholars were skeptical that it was there. So this is an example of the fact that sometimes we read something in the New Testament that has not yet been discovered, but in time it is, and usually the discovery verifies the historical claim of the New Testament. Let's talk about main characters. I want to address four of the big ones in the New Testament, John the Baptist, Jesus, Pontius Pilate, and Herod the Great. Let's start with John the Baptist. According to the Gospel of Mark, John the Baptist, we read this story on the first night with that Mark and sandwich. John the Baptist was imprisoned by Herod Antipas. Okay, there's the second Herod, the son of Herod the Great. He was imprisoned by Herod Antipas because Herod had married his brother's wife, and John calls him out on it. Now, if you think about this for a minute, I think most of us would have advised John not to do that. Not because uh, we approve of Herod marrying his brother's wife, but because the intermarriages among the Herodian family were so infamous and so scandalous that you asked, why would you make a point about yet another one? And yet John does. Uh, perhaps that's one of the characteristics of a true prophet, that it's not the scale of an injustice that 
makes it more or less of an injustice or more or less accessible, acceptable, but it is pure and simple, the injustice itself. It's a wrong. And whether you consider it great or less, it does not make it right. And so John does what for us is a highly unstrategic thing. He challenges Herod Antipas and said, you should not be marrying your brother's wife. Now, Antipas is in trouble. He arrests the Baptist. And he has to because John the Baptist is too powerful to allow not to be arrested. He must uh, uh, curtail him. But he's also too powerful to kill. So he has to keep him in prison, but not annihilate him. And so we see this story that then he finds a pretext to kill him, and in fact he does. You know that uh, he cuts his head off and gives it as a gift to his um, wife's daughter who dances for him. It happens that Josephus also tells this same story. And here's how Josephus narrates the death of John the Baptist. Josephus agrees in all of the salient points with the Gospel of Mark. Herod imprisoned John, though he was a good man. The Baptist exhorted Jews to righteous living, says Josephus, to justice, piety, and baptism. The Baptist warned people not to presume on God, says Josephus. Herod imprisoned John because he feared his standing and power with the common people. Now, this is slightly different. The New Testament says he imprisoned him because of the moral charge. Josephus says, well, it's really because he was afraid that John's power with the common people would be greater than his own power. And so Josephus says, Herod struck first and to be rid of him before his work led to an uprising. Josephus concludes that the death, that the, that the defeat of Herod's army, and he was defeated afterwards, was God's vengeance on Herod for the killing of John the Baptist. Now, we see here two accounts of the death of John the Baptist, one in the Gospels, one from Josephus, hasn't read the Gospels, Gospels aren't written when Josephus writes, that agree in their fundamentals the same, but there are two differences. Number one, the New Testament doesn't tell us where John is killed, but it leads us to assume it was in Tiberias. Josephus says, no, no, he's killed in Macheras, which is on the west side of the Dead Sea, at one of the Herodian castles. And secondly, as I just mentioned before, the New Testament says that Herod Antipas killed John the Baptist because John challenged his marrying his brother's wife. Josephus says, no, it was more political. He was afraid of John's power with the people, and he could not afford to allow him to live because John was too influential. Well, perhaps both of those things are true, but what we can say is that we have a remarkable collaboration and agreement that John the Baptist was killed by Herod Antipas at exactly this time because he crossed a red line with this ruler that the ruler could not afford to cross. Point closed. Let's talk about Jesus. What do we know about Jesus from first century sources that are not the New Testament, that are not Christian? Well, Josephus himself has a brief paragraph on Jesus. Now, remember, Josephus is not a Christian. He is a Jew who has collaborated with the Romans to destroy the Jewish rebellion in Jerusalem and is now profiting immensely because of Roman largesse, because of his endorsement of Rome during the Jewish war. 
This is what Josephus says about Jesus of Nazareth. It's shorter than what he says about John the Baptist. Here it is. I quote it. About this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. Jesus was one who wrought surprising feats and was a teacher of such people as gladly accept the truth. There we go. He was a worker of wonders, miracles, and he was a great teacher of the populace. Well, that certainly agrees with the New Testament. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. Well, we know he won over many Jews. We didn't know that maybe he had quite as much influence in the Greeks. Well, Josephus said he did. He was the Messiah. When Pilate, upon hearing him, accused by men of the highest standing amongst us, had condemned him to be crucified, that's agreed, Pilate crucifies Jesus, both Josephus and the New Testament agree. Those who at first had come to love him did not cease being his disciples. That certainly agrees with the New Testament. The crucifixion of Jesus did not cause his followers to cease being his followers. On the third day, he appeared to them restored to life, for the prophets of God had prophesied these and countless other marvelous things about him. And the tribe of Christians, that's an interesting phrase. It's not a Christian phrase. The tribe of Christians that are called for him still to this day have not disappeared. So when Josephus writes in about 70 AD or 80, he's aware there's plenty of Christians around who still hail after Jesus. Now let me say two things about this. I mentioned that Josephus was a Jewish rebel who betrayed the cause and fought for the Romans against the Jews. Fought successfully for, with the Romans against the Jews. He he went with both Titus and Domitian to Jerusalem and advised them as they tore down the walls and demolished Judaism. And Josephus was, guess what, hated by the Jews. Jews did not copy his works. It was Christian authors who copied Josephus' works, and it's very possible that Christian authors might have put into this, he was the Messiah, or that he was raised from the dead. I'm more than willing to imagine that a Christian scribe who is copying Josephus, who loved and learned Jesus, would be willing to modify the text. But even if we strike those points, the reference to Jesus as a Messiah and the resurrection, even if we strike them, we have here in this testimony of Josephus a remarkably uniform summary of the life of Jesus that agrees with the New Testament. Let's go to Pontius Pilate. In the first century, in this imperial province, the Romans had to decide how they were going to rule these obstreperous Jewish people who refused to serve any god except for Yahweh. And so Rome came up with a governor system in the first century in which they would send prefects or governors to Rome in order to work with the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin would actually make the rules, but the governor would be the instrument behind the rules. And this actually worked, because as long as the Sanhedrin made the rules, then Jews would follow them. If the uncircumcised pagan Romans made the rules, the Jews wouldn't. So the Romans learned to filter their power and their policies through the Sanhedrin. And it worked for 60 years until the Great Revolt in AD 66. The prefects or procurators that Rome sent were usually short-lived and of little success. The longest was Pontius Pilate. He ruled 
from 26 to 37. He was by far the most capable that Rome sent, but he also was rash. He was brutal, and he was inflexible. And we have a number of Jewish authors, Philo, Josephus, and actually some Roman authors, Tacitus, who report on Pontius Pilate, and their reports are not positive. On one occasion, Pilate showed disdain of Jewish customs by introducing into military standards uh, bearing the emperor's bust, and thus he violated the Jewish ban on images. He, in other words, tries to put his face into the Sanhedrin. The offended Jews rioted in Caesarea, and Pilate bashed them down by slitting their throats and by reducing them to rubble. In another case, Pilate attacked Jews who protested his use of temple funds. Pilate wanted to use temple funds to build an aqueduct. The Jews said that was not what they were for. He killed large numbers with his soldiers, and he trampled others to death with his horses. Luke chapter 13 says that the Samaritan Jews offended Pilate and Pilate slayed them and mixed their blood with their offerings in revenge. A brutal scene. Philo and Josephus tell this exact same story. Now anybody who reads these stories of Pilate is not going to have any trouble believing that when push comes to shove, Pilate is willing to sacrifice this Jewish rabbi by the name of Jesus from wherever he was, I guess it was Nazareth, in order to placate the crowd. And so we have no doubt, and we have no reason to doubt, that Pilate's sacrificing of Jesus was yet another example of his political strategy of brutality. Last, and finally, Herod the Great. As I said at the beginning, Herod the Great uh, was the first of many Herods in this dynasty in the first and second centuries. Herod the Great uh, is a person of absolute extremities. He was one of the greatest builders in history. When you go to Israel today, every single day you are there, you will see a magnificent structure still standing that bears the marks of Herod the Great. He was uh, a master builder. He also united the people in a way that no one else could have done. He was one of those unique persons who was a kingdom maker by sheer force. But on the other hand, he was utterly ruthless. He had no moral principles at all. He was Machiavellian before Machiavelli. He was will to power long before Schopenhauer or Nietzsche. He was utter ruthlessness. Why? He married 10 wives. He killed three of them. He killed three of his own sons, whom he feared were trying to displace him. He killed a brother-in-law. He drowned a cousin, Aristobulus, in his swimming pool. And he killed his wife's father-in-law. He refused to allow the priests to move and to serve by grabbing their robes and hiding them so that Herod could set all of the policies for Palestine. We have, in other words, the description of a person who was self-serving from first to last, for whom ethics 
made no difference, but his own success made all the difference. So anybody who knows this about Herod has no trouble believing that he was capable of doing what the New Testament said he did, of killing all of the babies in Bethlehem because he wanted to be sure that he got rid of this Messiah who was born there, whom we know as Jesus. Now, this real brief survey about dating and about the verification of certain events that we otherwise wouldn't know apart from uh, uh, secular history and about these four persons reminds us that the New Testament is a historical document that was in the world that the Romans themselves participated in and about which they had their own histories. And that the various points where we can compare those histories and overlap them, we find that the testimony of the New Testament is as accurate or sometimes more so because the New Testament is written so close to the events that it describes than the Roman and the Greek sources themselves. The point of our statement is that this is a, the incarnation is a historical statement. And these historical attributes help us to be assured that the Jesus of Nazareth is the Jesus who really did exist in history. Let me conclude with what may be something of a modern analogy. Uh, when I was first married many years ago, my wife and I went on a vacation in Colorado and we ran out of money. This was before credit cards, before cell phones and email. And so I called my bank in Colorado Springs, Colorado Springs National Bank, and asked to speak to the president. I did not know the president of the bank, but my father knew him because both he and my father were skiers together. His name was Bill Armstrong, and I got him on the phone, and I introduced myself as Jim Edwards. And I said, Mr. Armstrong, I want to get $500 from my bank account. Will you please do that for me? Now, he had no way of knowing if, in fact, I was Jim Edwards. And so, and I didn't know how he was going to respond, and so he said, okay, tell me about your father's family. I said, well, what do you want to know? And he says, well, tell me about your father's um, aunts and uncles. I said, well, my father had uh, three aunts, Lucy and Dorothy and Mary Jane and one brother, Cecil, okay. Did your father have any siblings? Yes, he had two siblings, two sisters, Ruth and Esther. How many of these people are still alive? He asked me these questions that he knew the answers to in order to find out if I knew the answers to them. And after about five minutes, it was pretty clear to Bill Armstrong that the supposed Jim Edwards on the phone was actually the real Jim Edwards because it's possible that somebody else could have known those names and dates, but it's very improbable. He sent me the 500 bucks. Now, why do I tell this story? I tell this because I think you and I are like Bill Armstrong. We're the president of the bank, and we get a call from the Gospel of Mark. And Mark gives us a number of historical testimonies. He tells us a story, and we have every right to ask of history how accurate this story is. Is this just a myth? Is this made up? Or does it, in fact, correspond to the other factors and parameters of history that we know in the area? And if it does, then to the degree that it does, the probability of its veracity, the probability of its truth rises.
And we as Christians can be so thankful that the other witnesses of history of the first century affirm the picture of Jesus and the events of the New Testament as far as they can be corroborated by the history of the area to a remarkably high degree. Now, this does not prove Jesus Christ or the truth of the New Testament, but it certainly increases the probability that the claims of the New Testament are worthy of serious consideration because they have serious corroboration from ancient history. I'm going to stop there. Thanks very much, Professor Edwards. Uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. So uh, if anyone has any questions, there's, I'm afraid, Jack, there's one just where you come back from. If you could stand up when you're asking your questions, uh, then they can film you. Um, what if someone makes a convincing and cogent argument against a historical claim? For example, those ruins four miles or north of Tiberias were not found. Sorry, didn't get that. Th those ruins four miles of Tiberias, let's say they were never found due to human error. Then what? How does that affect a religious community, in your opinion? I see how it would affect historical debate, but if, if, if historical validity is this important, what about when people have strong arguments against historical verification? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So let's admit that in a document like the New Testament that makes many historical claims, that after 2,000 years and all of the various kingdoms and powers that have gone through the, the ancient Near East, it's, it's unrealistic to imagine that every single historical claim in the New Testament can be justified. That would be true for any story, not just the New Testament. So I'm not making that claim. I'm not saying that every detail that you might question, we will certainly find an answer to. And so we will be able to prove that the New Testament is correct. That's impossible. And even if we could prove it, that we talked about this last night, faith is not something you can prove. You still have to make a choice to believe it, right? Okay. My simple point is this. Many people assume that the New Testament is simply a bunch of bosh made up by pious people. And that this Jesus, if he did exist, was maybe a good man, but you guys have made all kinds of, of hocus pocus out of him, and I don't want to buy it. And my point here is that uh, we're not trying to make hocus pocus. We're trying simply to um, be, be aware of the evidence that exists, set it forth, and allow a person with a thinking mind and an inquisitive heart to decide for him or herself whether the probability of this story is in its favor or against it. And I want to argue, and I've spent my life working in this, and I've never been disappointed, that the probability of the truth of this story historically is really immensely high given the fact that it's 2,000 years past. Could you say just a little bit more about the place mentioned in Mark 8 as to how they verified that was, was it Dalmanutha? Dalmanutha. Yeah. Right, uh, the question in Mark 8, this, this town of... Um, Dalmanuth or Magdala. We get Mary from Magdala, Mary Magdalene. They discovered a synagogue there in which they actually have the word Magdala in it. And you can see all of this today. Um, and it's, it's really quite exciting because the ironic thing about this is we normally think if something has been discovered in Palestine, uh, 
um, it's maybe 20 feet below the, the ground. The, this synagogue in Magdala was 18 inches below the, um, the sand on the seashore of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, people have been surfing there, they've been water skiing there, and 18 inches below them was this very important archaeological site, just barely below the ground, that once it was uncovered, they discovered a virtual city there. So this was one of the more unusual discoveries, is that it was just waiting to be discovered sooner or later. Uh, unlike many of them are very difficult to discover, this one was actually very easy, and it's right in one of the most public places in Palestine. And it's a beautiful site, but it certainly uh, helps us to remind ourselves that Mary Magdala comes from this site, and this is the place where her city existed. If we only consider non-Christian historical documents, what is the single most certain fact about the life of Jesus? If, that's a wonderful question. If we consider non-Christian documents, what is the single most certain fact we can discover about the life of Jesus? The single most certain fact that we can discover about the life of Jesus is that his life and teaching created a community called Christians that have borne witness to him for 2,000 years around the world. And that the witness that they bear is based upon and verifies the life that he lived in the first century. So the greatest witness is you and me to the truth of the gospel. It was more a statement rather than a question. It's if you accept that the Christians were persecuted by the Romans, which I think historically is correct, you wouldn't usually go to the bother persecuting somebody if you could discredit it. So the first thing they'd probably look at doing is trying to discredit what the early Christian church was saying long before you start persecuting them. Well, thank you for that comment. I like that. Um, your point is that the first thing you would do would be to discredit the claims of Christianity. Is that correct? Right. And that's very difficult to do, I think, given the fact, although, of course, many have tried, but after all of the archaeological work that has been done, um, it's increasingly true that the, the, um, the plethora of information about the historical geography of the Bible makes the credibility of both the Old and New Testaments far more reasonable and convincing than any other option before us. So I think we're, we're out of time, really. We're uh, running towards uh, into the interval time. I just want to say, I was talking to somebody, a cynical man, halfway down the church, um, that today, and I was, I was saying to him how much I loved uh, James's, uh, Professor James's commentary on the Gospel of Mark, and he said to me, oh, I thought you were just trying to sell books. Uh, now, the point is, I'm not trying to say, we don't get any profit from this, but just to say to you that the bookshop is open, and this is, the, this is a copy of the, the commentary. Again, I don't know what you, if you know about commentaries, but the whole point of a commentary is to help you to understand the Gospel. So what you do is you read the, the Gospel, and then you see, uh, you read the commentary, and the commentary explains it and throws light to you. Once you see, if you want to know a bit more about the gospel, uh, I really do think, without ha having any vested interest, that this is the best commentary I've ever read on Mark's gospel. And it's available in our bookshop straight after this announcement. We're going for tea and coffee and drinks in the octagon. Can you please, as soon as you get your tea and coffee, move away from the table so that we can uh, get everybody through as quickly as possible. We'll see you in 15 minutes.
I think we will proceed with the second hour. It's 815. Welcome back, everyone. As I said at the beginning of this session today, we want to turn to this question of discipleship, that the Gospel of Mark has these two major thrusts. Who is Jesus? He's the Son of God, whose sonship is manifested on the cross. And if we don't see it on the cross, we don't see it properly. And secondly, that it calls disciples into fellowship with himself. Let me remind you, we're going to talk about discipleship in the second hour, that the word disciple comes from the Greek word mathetes, which means a learner. We get the word mathematics from this. But learner is oftentimes associated with what we would call school learning, where a teacher speaks and students sit with a book and a pen or a iPad and receive. The word mathetes is not quite that. It would better be translated as an apprentice. An apprentice is somebody who learns, but he learns not by passivity, by simply receiving, but by participating. I became a a plasterer's apprentice when I was in high school learning how to plaster walls by working with plasterers, people who work with cement and plaster, and <clears throat> making mud for them, <clears throat> making hod, but also learning to do it by their example. And this is what Jesus does. He teaches his disciples not by classroom, but by field activity, and as they are with him, they learn who he is. Jewish rabbis were famous for calling their disciples, <clears throat> but their disciples came from educated classes. Jesus' disciples did not come from educated classes, as we'll see that in a moment, but rather from the common trades. We often imagine that his disciples were paragons of faithfulness. <clears throat> we name churches after them. We put stained glass windows. They become pendants that we hang around our necks. But when you read the Gospel of Mark, you're going to find that disciples are oftentimes not virtuous. In fact, rarely so. And that their behavior is either distressing or off-putting, sometimes scandalous. Their discipleship does not depend, I'll say this at the beginning, I'm going to say it at the middle, and I'll say it at the end, their discipleship in the Gospel of Mark does not depend upon their faithfulness. It does not depend upon their scoring 70 or above on the final exam. It does not depend upon how many mistakes they cease from making. It rather depends on Jesus' continual acceptance of them and working with them as his followers. Discipleship. Discipleship is so important in Mark that it becomes the first public act of Jesus' ministry. The first thing Jesus does after he is baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, at which point we have this Trinitarian uh, event revelation where the Father anoints the Son through the Holy Spirit and declares Jesus, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The first thing that Jesus does after that event in which he has been formally by God acknowledged and introduced to John and those present, is to go to the Sea of Galilee and call four fishermen to follow him. Those four fishermen, Peter, Andrew, John, and James, 
become the most important cadre of the 12 apostles who follow them. They are with him throughout his ministry. As far as we know, they know absolutely nothing about Jesus. He calls them into discipleship not once they have passed a preliminary exam, but when they have passed no exam, and they learn about him only as they follow him, incrementally, by mistakes, by progress, by following false roads, and Jesus remains faithful to them. The most important definition of discipleship, in, in my mind, in all of the Bible, but especially in the Gospel of Mark, is found in chapter 3, when, after calling a number of people into communion with himself, we see this account of the call and the naming of the Twelve. I'm reading from Mark chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus goes up, remember I said that Mark writes in the present tense, um, Jesus goes up into the mountain and he summons those whom he wished and they came to him. This is a very strong statement. Mark is not telling us that Jesus just hung out with these people and said, hey, let's have coffee together. Rather, he goes up to the mountain. The mountain is a place where God reveals himself. He summons a summons is a, a very serious intentional call. Those whom he wishes, he's not just saying those who happen to be there, but he desires these, and they come to him. It's not he to them. So we have Jesus in a prominent place who is in a commanding position and is receiving people into his presence. Verse 14, he made them 12, a very interesting word. We wouldn't think that. We would say he chose 12. It, I oftentimes wonder if Mark is not suggesting in the same way that God made heaven and earth in Genesis 1-1, that Jesus is making a new creation here in the 12. He made them 12. He called them apostles. The word apostles means somebody who is sent with a commission. If you send your son... Uh, to get a loaf of bread, that's an apostle. You've sent him out to do something with a commission, and that's exactly what an apostle is. He called them, he chose them 12 whom he called apostles in order that they might be with him, in order that he would send them to proclaim, and in order that they would have authority to cast out demons. That is the most important definition of discipleship in all the Bible because it tells us that a disciple of Jesus is relational to be with him, it's verbal to proclaim, and it's behavioral to oppose evil, to cast out demons. Relational, verbal, behavioral incorporates the three major facets of what it means to be a human being. And I want to say that that order is important. We oftentimes think that to be a disciple of Jesus means we have to start with the ethical. I must get better. I'm not good enough. Jesus wouldn't take me this way. That is exactly the wrong place. You cannot put these in reverse, that we do good things for Jesus, we say good things about Jesus, therefore we are with Jesus. It will not work that way. The call to discipleship is a call first and foremost to be with Christ. It's not something you do. It's not something you plan. It's not something you intend. It is something you accept a fellowship, a relationship, a fellowship with Christ. And it is from that relationship that the speaking and the acting are informed. And apart from that being with Christ, that withness, the speaking and the acting will not be informed. 
Discipleship with Christ is first and foremost a who, Jesus, rather than a what, do this, say that. He calls them that they would be with him. One of the most important things we can ever say to anyone or do for anyone, I'm going to close with a story about this, is this magical, simple truth of simply desiring to be with that person. And this is God's will for us. I hope that as you leave this meeting tonight and go home, you will just reflect on this. God sent his son into this world for the simple saving purpose to be with me and that I would be with him. And it is that relationship of community that all Christian life feeds upon and represents. The second thing that we learn from this is that Jesus names these disciples. I'm going to continue reading here. He made them 12, and he gave them names to Simon. He called Peter. Peter means rock. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. He gave them the names of sons of thunder. Uh, they must have had short fuses because he says these guys are fly off the handle, so they're called that. Then there was Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, another James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot. Canaanite may have been a zealot, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Now the interesting thing about these names is that we know so little about them. The only ones that are named to any extent in the Bible are the first three, Peter, James, and John. Andrew appears occasionally. And then, of course, Judas Iscariot. I want to make three comments about these names. The fact that they are 12, of course, is obvious. This is to say that Jesus is very consciously choosing to constitute among his followers a tradition that he has inherited from the Old Testament in the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's impossible to deny that Jesus is clearly signifying with 12. 12 was a very uncommon number in the Old Testament, incidentally. Seven, very common. Ten, common. Twelve, not common at all. Apart from the 12 tribes of Jacob, you very seldomly see 12 in the Old Testament. The same is true in the New Testament. When the early church wants to choose deacons, it doesn't choose 12, it chooses seven. This 12 is odd, and it's fixed because of the 12 apostles. Jesus is clearly signifying that this is the new Israel, the completed Israel, the fulfillment of the purpose and the prophetic promise to Israel throughout history in these 12. Three comments about them. Number one, most of the names of these 12 we never hear from again. Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, we don't hear from them again. I want you to know that these silent witnesses to the faith are the most important witnesses. You should read these names and you should give thanks for these people that you've never heard of before because it was their faithfulness, which now forgotten, has led to someone else coming to faith who also has become forgotten, but his faithfulness has led to someone else and that you and I are sitting in this church today, disciples of Jesus Christ, because of a faithful chain of witnesses, long, long forgotten, but unbroken by the Holy Spirit, that has brought us to faith. 
and that someday in the future there will be people sitting in this church and other churches around the world who have never heard of you and me but will know the gospel because of the faithful chain that you and I represent here and now in our time. The second thing I want to say about this is that none of these names come from the religious establishment. Not a one of them is a Pharisee, a Sadducee. One is a Zealot. There's none from Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's no scribe. There's no lawyer. There's no chief priest. These are all common people. They are hardworking people. They are frugal people. They are successful people. They're good merchants. But they are not part of the intellectual and the power structure of Palestine. They are people much more like me, at least, and perhaps you, than they are people who are the influences influencers in our world today. I think we all live in a world in which we long to see the efficacy of Jesus Christ play a far greater role in the world. Trust me, God can use common people like us in uncommon ways to do uncommon good. And third and finally, the name of Judas Iscariot. I am amazed that Judas', Judas name is given. I feel rather certain that Mark and the early church would rather have extirpated that name and omitted it, but they didn't. They included Judas's name. Judas betrayed Christ. He betrayed the cause, and I'm glad they included his name because Mark tells us that the discipleship is not a utopian society. It is not a place free from sin or even betrayal. It is not a, prote a perfected people. It is, rather, a community of people very much like us who are inherent sinful people who make mistakes sometimes unwillingly and oftentimes knowingly and willingly, who nevertheless love Christ, are with Christ, want to speak of Christ, and want to be used by Christ. We're going to see in the story of discipleship today that Jesus has very different relationships and reactions to his disciples, often of them, many of them are quite shocking actually, but one thing we never see, he never rejects the disciples. They remain with him, and he remains with them. And so for the second time of many in this evening, what is the first, most important, and most lasting aspect of being a disciple of Jesus? It is to be with him. Let's move on. We find that throughout the Gospel of Mark, disciples are presented in a number of ways. If we look at chapter 8, verses 16 through 18, we find that in the very midst of Jesus' ministry, after they have seen miracle after miracle, they have even been sent out into mission on his behalf, they are crossing the Sea of Galilee in a boat, and they have the most stupid argument possible. They were debating among themselves what they were going to eat because they had no bread. Jesus knew what was on their mind, and he said, why are you worrying about bread? Do you not understand? Is it not clear to you? Are your hearts so hardened? Are your eyes blinded? Are your ears deafened? Do you not remember the five loaves that I fed, the 12 loaves that I broke? Seven times Jesus um, reminds the disciples, he accosts the disciples for being 
uncomprehending, for being dull, and if I may say, for simply being stupid. Well, it's not at all a glorious description of disciples, but it's really helpful because, at least to me, I find that after all the years that I have been a disciple, I find myself oftentimes, more often than I wish, very much like this, and uncomprehended, slow to believe, and slow to hear follower of Jesus, just like the first 12. A second vignette on the disciples comes in the third chapter. I bet I'm going to read a verse that none of you has ever remembered before because it's rather shocking, actually. It's in chapter 3, verse 21. We're told in verse 20 that Jesus enters into a house and everyone came to him, the crowd came to him, because they were, um, they were not able uh, to get inside. And then in verse 21, it says this, And those around Jesus, when they heard of him, they tried to seize him, for they said, He has gone mad. Now, Mark doesn't tell us who the those around him was, were. It could have been his family members. As far as we know, his brothers and sisters did not confess him during their lifetime, during his lifetime. It could have been his disciples. Mark is very oblique here. And those who were around him when they heard what he was saying about Beelzebul, they are so concerned that he's gone berserk that they try to deprogram him. They try to constrain him because they say, he's gone off the deep end. We very seldomly recognize that the disciples in this instance are actually deciding in mass to obstruct Jesus. Chapter 14, we see a story of the disciples being very contentious. Verses 4 and 5. There were some of the disciples who were indignant when they saw that Jesus had broken this jar of expensive ointment. And they said, should not this have been sold for lots of money and we could have given it to a far better social cause? We could have given it to the, to the poor. And Mark says they were miffed. They were indignant toward Jesus. We see here that the disciples once again seeing the grace of Jesus towards a woman who has expended a very expensive jar of perfume upon him, criticize this woman and reject her in his presence and him as well for receiving that gift. They try to obstruct. We, of course, see the disciples in other ways that are completely natural and completely understandable they grow tired, and they grow weary. In the last days of Jesus' life, they're going morning, noon, and night. The authorities are after Jesus. They're trying to hide from them. They're trying to be undercover. In the Garden of Gethsemane, what do the disciples do? They absolutely collapse. If you would have asked Peter or John, why are you sleeping? They said, because I am exhausted. I have no trouble believing that at all but we see the intense humanness of the disciples in that instance. When we go further in chapter 14, we see things far worse. In chapter 14, verses 17 through 21, we see that one of Jesus' disciples knowingly enters into collusion with his chief enemies who have resolved to 
take him out, and betrays him for 30 pieces of silver. This is called betrayal. It's called betrayal and traitorousness. That is, of course, Judas Iscariot. But it's not left to Judas. In the same chapter, we see that the chief apostle, not the last one in the name Judas Iscariot, but the first one who will become the head of the church, Peter, who, when he is approached by a servant girl and asking if he's ever heard of Jesus of Nazareth, snaps back three times at her that he has no idea who she's talking about and tells her to shut up. Now this is a most remarkable panoply, panorama, collection of testimonies to Jesus' disciples. It's not at all positive. There are, in the Gospel of Mark, more positive presentations of Jesus towards the disciples. But these are there, and they're very troubling. No gospel portrays the disciples with as unadorned judgment as Mark does. It's my view that the chief source of Mark's gospel is Peter, for Mark was one of Peter's associates in Rome. And if that is the case, this, this raw and unadorned profile of disciples is not Mark's inventions. It is Peter's confession and reminiscence. How should we respond to this? I want to say what I said before. The most remarkable thing about Mark's picture of the disciples is not how rough cut they are. It's not how much they are like we are. It is not that we see ourselves in them so clearly. It is that Jesus never rejects them. They reject him but he does not reject them. We may ask why he doesn't, but in fact, he doesn't. Third and finally, discipleship in the Gospel of Mark is portrayed by a metaphor of being on the way with Jesus. The Gospel of Mark is basically divided into two halves. The first eight chapters depict Jesus walking rather aimlessly and without any perceived goal around this northwest quadrant of the Sea of Galilee, going here, going there, teaching this, teaching that, but never arriving at any place or staying there. In chapter 8, from chapter 8 or 9 through 16, the, the discipleship and the ministry of Jesus changes radically from this circuitous wanderings around the Sea of Galilee to a straight shot, a rifle shot, on the way to Jerusalem. Jesus, from chapter 8 onward, is clear to go to Jerusalem where he knows his passion and ministry must be completed. And it is on that second half that we see this refrain coming through, that to be a disciple with Jesus is to be on the way with him. He heals blind Bartimaeus, and it says that blind Bartimaeus followed him on the way to Jerusalem. I have to tell you I love that image. I think as Christians, we're often asked, describe for me the Christian faith. How would you, uh, what images would you use for yourself? And we say, well, I'm a believer, I'm a student, I'm this or that. I would include or encourage you to think of this. I am 
on the way with Jesus. We are underway together. This is an activity in which Christ is revealing himself more to me and I am learning more from him. He does not reject, he does not desert, he rather takes us with him on the way. Let's go back to that first definition of discipleship. Jesus made them 12, that they might be with him, speak of him, act for him. The witness of Christ is the formative element in your Christian life. The last verse of the Gospel of Matthew, Behold, I am with you always. This is the greatest promise. Not that we earn his presence, that we deserve his presence, but he gives it to us like he gave it to Peter and John, irrespective of our merits. And as we are with him, we begin to look like him. When I was 32, I got a mole on my right leg that grew and I had it removed from a doctor. They examined it and said it was a level four melanoma. 1978, and they wanted to see if, after the operation, if the lymph system that had been removed from my right leg had melanoma in it or not. The doctor told me, said, if the lymph system does not have melanoma, you have a chance of living. If it does have melanoma, you have little chance of living. That dis that. Uh, operation took place on a Friday afternoon. The doctor said, you won't get the lab result until Monday morning. It was a tense weekend, wondering how that lab report would come out. Monday morning came around, and I didn't hear. Monday noon came, I didn't hear. Afternoon, I didn't hear. At 5 o'clock on Monday afternoon, a shock went through me, and I understood why I hadn't heard it became clear to me I had melanoma in my lymph system and they weren't telling me. And I can't tell you how I just plummeted into despair. In the space of five seconds, I became furious, depressed, angry. I thought to myself, I'm 32 and I'm probably not going to live. I was a minister at that time and had received lots and lots of visitors, and I was exhausted from my visitors because I found that I had to pump them up instead of them pumping me up. I didn't want anybody to come into my room. I looked at the end of my bed. There was a cross. I was in a Catholic hospital, and I just stared at that. I was just fuming. A man showed up at the door, stood for about five seconds, and then slowly walked across the foot of my bed. I knew who he was. His name was George Sheffer. He was a young life leader, a rough-cut man on the outside, but a dear and sincere man on the inside. He walked across and sat down in a chair about four feet from me. I could hear him breathing. I wasn't going to speak. I was too angry. Five minutes passed. He said nothing. 10 minutes, 15, neither of us spoke. I was not going to speak. 45 minutes later, he quietly got up and walked across my vision, paused at the door, and left. I don't know how long you think 45 minutes is in the room with another person not speaking. It's a long time. <laughs> 
we never spoke a word. And yet, when he left, I was a slightly changed person. I was calmer. I was less desperate. I was less angry. I was more composed. Somehow, George's presence with me. No words, no plans, no program. His presence with me had given me strength, not hope, but strength to face whatever would happen. That was a profound example of the witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. At 6 o'clock, 15 minutes later, the nurse came in, said, Dr. Edwards, you'll be glad to hear that we didn't discover any cancer in your lymph system. I was greatly relieved. I said, how long have you known that? She said, well, we got the news this morning, but it's been a busy day. We couldn't come in. I said, well, it's good news even though it's late. Jesus Christ says, I am with you to the end of the age. And I want you to know that as his disciples. You are probably no less worthy than Peter and the crew that he called. And many of you are probably much more. If you're better, don't take any credit for it. If you're worse, don't lose any hope. God's word is the same to you. I am with you always in Jesus Christ to the end of the world. So be it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beautiful, thanks, James. We've got eight minutes if anybody has any questions or comments or thoughts or, yeah. If you can stand up, that would be great. Um, you said that the Gospel of Mark was divided into two. Um, Jesus, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Jesus, the mission, a circular mission, and then his 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 mission to Jerusalem. How how long, how, how many months or years was his mission to Jerusalem? Yes, the, the question was that Mark divides Jesus' ministry into two major segments, the first eight chapters into this um, circuitous uh, kind of... Uh, purposeless, actually. It doesn't really have any destinations. Undetermined ministry around the Sea of Galilee. Um, shows up here, shows up there. It's much more like a shotgun. And then, boom, in chapter 7, we have a rifle shot on the way to Jerusalem. Nothing deflects him. He's just going to Jerusalem. It's quite different. And the question is, how long might this ministry have gone on? And the answer is, uh, we don't know. W this is one of the, remember when we talked about the four Gospels, these four portraits give us a very different picture of the length of Jesus' ministry. In the Gospel of John, we find three Passovers, which means that Jesus' ministry lasted how long? Three, three years. But in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have only one Passover. And if that is the case, it appears that Mark... Matthew and Luke are presenting Jesus' ministry as a single year, or even less. And I know of no way to resolve that difference. It could be that John is more correct there, and that the material in the Synoptic Gospels has just been accordion condensed into one major shot. But it also could be that the ministry of Jesus was actually less than a year. So we don't know. 
it was either one year or two or three, but it was not more. But even if it was three, it was a rather short period of time. And if it was one year, it was remarkably condensed. So what have I done? I've told you brilliantly what I don't know. Wondering how we know Mark was in Rome with Peter. How do we know that Mark was in Rome with Peter? Well, um, we, we don't know, but in the book of 1 Peter, Mark's name is mentioned. And we know that Paul included Mark in his later uh, travels. And we know from some of the church fathers that Mark and Peter had a relationship with one another. When we read the Gospel of Mark, we discover that some of the most complete and personal stories, I'm thinking, for example, of Peter's, um, the story of Peter in the, in the courtyard with a girl who, who challenges him. These come and only come from Peter. So it appears as though Peter is the source of a number of, of, of uh, narratives in the Gospel of Mark that he alone must be the, the uh, source of. And since Mark was one of his disciples in Rome, we assume that perhaps Mark is the one who put down Peter's memory with other memories into what we know as the Gospel of Mark. And I've heard that um, there's a possibility that Jesus' main year was a sabbatical year for the Jews. And that was the only way that he Jesus could... Jesus' what year? That it was a sabbatical year for the Jewish nation in that every seven years they allowed the fields to lie fallow. And that that's the only way he could have gathered so many of the crowds that he was able to bring um, because they would not be working. So I find it quite surprising that there's this thought that it's three-year ministry as against a one-year. Do you have any comments on the possibility of that? Well, the question uh, is about the year of Jubilee and the sabbatical year. I'm going to have to disappoint you uh, again or magnificently on this answer. Of all the aspects of the ancient world that I simply cannot understand, it's calendrical issues. The calendars were so important in Jews, and I don't understand them, and I'm not at all interested in them. And so I'm just going to have to confess that I knowingly, willingly, perhaps even sinfully, have neglected calendrical issues in my studies, and hence I'm of no value to you in trying to answer that question. Um, <laughs> there's, there's honesty for you. Ask for your forgiveness. <laughs> you have it. We have one minute and ten seconds if anybody has. Uh... The last few nights you mentioned Jesus' and brothers and sisters. Um, what's the little, the latest biblical scholarship on Mark 3, 31, 35? And what's your understanding um, of Jesus' brothers? The question is uh, Jesus' family members. Yesterday or the day before, we read this uh, sixth chapter of Mark, where we are given the name of three of Jesus' brothers, his mother Mary, three of his brothers, and then his sisters. The sisters are not named, uh, and the reason for that is probably because women were married into other families, and they actually ceased to be part of the birth family. But the sons are named. With Jesus, it would be four boys in the family. Um, Mark does not tell us that these brothers were half-brothers. It simply calls them the sons of Mary. And I think the New Testament is willing to accept that. Some traditions uh, want to maintain, and perhaps rightly so, but it would be more dogmatic than historical, that these brothers were not uh, of Mary, who remained a a virgin.
but were from, a, say, a previous marriage by Joseph. I can't answer that except to say that the New Testament itself seems to assume that these are the family of Jesus, born of Mary and Joseph, and for them that provides, or that um, causes no major problem, even though we see very, very clearly that the virgin birth of Jesus is taught in the New Testament. So that, um, that alarm clock was, uh, my alarm clock going off to say that it's nine o'clock. Uh, Professor James is a, an outstanding scripture scholar. I'm a dogmatist, and as a dogmatist, we disagree on this one. So, <laughs> so uh, but, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a matter of debate. Um, so what is not a matter of debate is that you people are fantastic for coming out on a cold and wet um, uh, Thursday evening in October, and um, you deserve uh, to be... Uh, to be congratulated and you deserve to go home and have a nice uh, glass of something when you go home. Remember, this is our penultimate evening. They've been with Jesus for four days. Don't give up and we'll see you all and we'll be with Jesus hopefully tomorrow evening. We'll be with Jesus and we'll be with Professor James tomorrow evening for our final evening. Let's stand and finish with the prayer which you'll find on the back of the event guide. So let's pray together. Lord God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us as we go forth, empowering us to glorify your name. As we end our meeting, we ask for your guidance and wisdom. Help us to use what we have learned in our lives. Help us to practice what we have discovered, and may it bear good fruit in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Lady, Mother of the Church, St. Andrew, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Safe home. See you tomorrow.